most of you are well aware of the fact that the journey that Israel went on represents the spiritual journey that we all go through as believers because we've all been given a promised land. We all have a journey to take when we get there. And that leaving Egypt parallels our being delivered from sin. Paul talks about how the crossing of the Red Sea symbolizes baptism, which of course symbolizes death to the old man and resurrection into a new life in the Messiah. But what most of you could not do is explain a whole lot of details about that. Most of you cannot really explain the details about how every little small journey they take really represents something to us in our modern day lives. But that's exactly what my new book, The 42 Journey Pattern of Our Spiritual Growth and Prophecy, really delves into. It talks about the details of what all that symbolizes. And in the process of doing so, it also provides a tremendous amount of practical advice on how to live our life today, how to make our life better. And it also talks about a number of amazing places that this 42-stage pattern pops up because it pops up a lot in prophecy. And the God who says he makes known the end from the beginning has actually used this pattern in order to help us better understand the future, better understand the second coming, and how the events that are, go are going to unfold between now and when he returns. Not only does the 42-stage journey they spell out for us how we should live our lives. Not only does it give us a practical roadmap on how to handle the spiritual trials and tribulations that we go through in this life, but they also foretell future events that are going to happen in the future. This pattern is very important for understanding prophecy because the wilderness pattern has several fulfillments to it. It, it was fulfilled historically as Israel journeyed through the wilderness, but it was also fulfilled in the life of our Messiah. It's fulfilled in the life of every believer, and it is also fulfilled in the history or life of the entire world. And because it is fulfilled in the history of the world, then it helps us understand future events and because the history of the world and the journey that the world is going on historically also fits and fulfills this pattern that is recorded in the wilderness journey. Now, let me give you one of the examples in which we see this 42-stage pattern unfold in order to help explain to us what's going to happen in the future. This isn't the only example, but it is one of the examples. In Revelation 12, we see a story in which a woman leaves what Revelation 11:8 Spirit says is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt. And she goes into the wilderness, just as Israel went into the wilderness, and it says that she was pregnant and cried out in pain because she was about to give birth. Now, that's a very interesting parallel to what happened at, in the original wilderness journey. Because in the original wilderness journey, as soon as Israel left Egypt and came to their first encampment in the wilderness, that was when God gave Israel the regulations on the firstborn and, and what to do about the firstborn child. And here we see a woman leaving, the, it, leaving and going into the wilderness and she is about to give birth. It goes on to talk about how she would be in the wilderness for basically 1,260 days, or in other words, for 42 months. The same number as the number of encampments that are listed in Numbers 33. Because in Numbers 33, it devotes an entire chapter to describing the names of the places that Israel stayed at. If you count it, there's 42 of them in there. And here we've got a woman going into the wilderness for 42 months. This is not just simply a coincidence. This is a parallel. It is an intended parallel. And it's a very fascinating parallel as we begin to dig into it and understand it a lot better, which we're going to do right now. We also see in this passage that there's a tremendous parallel to the name of the second encampment that Israel came to in the wilderness, which was Etham. Etham means with them. And we see that being described in two senses here because it talks about this woman whose child is caught up to be with God and his throne. So that child, once it is snatched up into the heavenly realms, he is now with them. He is with God. He's with his throne. And we also see how it talks about Satan being cast down to earth where men are, and now Satan is now with them. He's now with men. He's now on the earth where men are. He's being thrown out of the heavenly realm and cast into the earthly realm. So these first six verses in Revelation 12 parallel the first two encampments of the wilderness journey. They contain events that describe and are paralleled by the names and or events of places that happened there. 
there's a tremendous number of parallels between this story and the wilderness journey. A lot of little details we see in here. A another example of a detail of a parallel that we see is that in Revelations 12, 14, it says the woman was given two wings of a great eagle. Now, if you turn back to Exodus or Shemot 19.4, it says, I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. The third encampment that Israel came to in the wilderness journey was called pi ha -hiroth. And pi means mouth. ha -hiroth refers to wrath being ignited or kindled. And we see the stage of pi ha -hiroth being fulfilled in one of the events listed here in Revelation 12. Because in Revelation 12, 15, it says, From his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. The dragon was enraged at the woman. So here we see his wrath being kindled. I mean, when you spew water out of your mouth in order to try to drown someone, obviously you're pretty mad at them. And we see it coming out of his mouth. So this perfectly parallels the third encampment that Israel came to in their wilderness journey. In Revelation 12, 16, it says the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river. Now, this parallels what happens in Exodus in which the waters opened up and Israel went through on dry land. The earth helped Israel in that situation as well. And, of course, when Israel went through the Yom Suf, they, when they went through that sea, there, it says there was a wall of, wall of water to their left, a wall of water to their right, which means they passed through what could be described as a mouth of some sort. Okay? When you take the wall of water to the left, the right, and the ground they were undering, that kind of forms the shape of some sort of a mouth. And we also see that this is an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth deliverance, or in this case, a mouth for a mouth deliverance, of God delivering Israel from its intended affliction through very much the same means that they were trying to be destroyed. Because Pharaoh thought that the sea would hem them in and give him sure, sure victory, something that they just couldn't escape from. But instead, it ended up being his sure defeat. The next encampment that Israel came to in the wilderness was a place called Marah, which means either rebellion or bitterness. And the next event we see happening in this series of events in Revelation, is that it says the beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who lived in heaven. So here what we see is an event that describes exactly the next encampment, which is rebellion or bitterness. He's rebelling against God and promoting bitterness on earth. So this perfectly parallels the fourth encampment that Israel stayed at in the wilderness. Now this is starting to get to a point in which it's getting beyond the realm of coincidence, okay? But as we get into this, we're going to see that this happens over and over and over again. The fifth place that Israel came to in the wilderness was a place called Elim, which means their leader. And we find that the next event in Revelation very much fits this because it says of the false messiah who will come, that he was given power to make war against the saints and conquer them and given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. So what we see here being described is that he has become their leader. So that perfectly fulfills the next encampment in Israel's wilderness journey. Again, we're getting beyond the realm of coincidence here. This is too much of a coincidence to merely be a coincidence. Now, the sixth encampment that Israel came to was a place called the Yom Suf. Now, in order for me to explain to you how the next series of events fulfills that, we have to stop and really understand what it's about uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's kind of complicated. Number two, a lot of people have been mistaught what this is about. The correct translation of the phrase Yom Suf is not Red Sea. Now, it can be translated in one of two things. It can be Reed Sea, which kind of almost makes me wonder whether Red Sea was... A, a typo from Reed Sea, or another possibly correct way of translating this is Sea of the End. Now, I think that actually is the correct way to translate that, and it's exactly what it's trying to communicate. We don't have to do any guesswork to understand what the Yom Suf spiritually represents because Paul explains this flat out for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul tells us that the crossing of that sea, the Yom Suf, spiritually represents baptism, which of course represents death to the old man of sin and resurrection to new life in the Messiah. Now, when Israel crossed that sea, it was death to Pharaoh and his army. 
And, of course, Pharaoh and his army represents that old man of sin. He ruled over Egypt, which, which represents our bondage to sin. Okay? But cr the crossing of that sea, the Yom Suf, symbolizes death to the old man and resurrection to new life. When Israel passed through the sea, they were born again as a nation. They came to a new life as a nation because suddenly they were free from Pharaoh's bondage. So if I were to tell you that the crossing of the Yom Suf symbolizes the reversal of death process so that we come into a new life process, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know from reading 1 Corinthians chapter 10. But what I want to show you next is how you can actually see this in the Hebrew scriptures. The Hebrew name of the sea that Israel crossed was the Yom Suf. Now this is actually a play on words in Hebrew because this is a play on words with the phrase Suf Chayim, which means end of life in Hebrew. Now, how do we get Yom Suf from Suf Chayim? Well, here's how we do it. Uh, here on the slide, you can actually see the phrase Suf Chayim spelled out. And there is a two-step process by which we get Yom Suf from Suf Chayim. The first thing we do is we remove Chet you those two letters, we take them and we pull them out of the phrase Suf Chayim until what we have is Suf Yom. So what we have done when we go from Suf Chayim to Suf Yom is we have removed the life from it. Then when we reverse the word order, we get Yom Suf. So we do two things in order to get from Suf Chayim to Yom Suf. The first thing we do is remove the life. The second thing we do is reverse the word order. Now this is exactly what Yom Suf symbolizes because Yom Suf symbolizes the reversal of the process of removing life from you. And that's not a, an astounding thing to tell you when you already know that this represents the same thing that baptism represents because you already know that the immersion process that you go through as a new believer is supposed to symbolize exactly that. But what I am showing you now is how you can see this in the original Hebrew thought that this is based on. And you have to see this in order to be able to build on it and understand how this actually applies in the next step. But whether you see this through Hebrew wordplay or whether you see this from the interpretation of 1 Corinthians 10, you can still see that Yom Suf is supposed to symbolize the reversal of the process of life ending. Now, Yom Suf is actually fulfilled in Revelation in Revelations 13, 8 through 10. And we actually see the concept of the end of life and the reversal of that process being discussed in several different ways. First of all, in Revelations 13, 8, it says, All the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. Now, right here, there are some ways with, in which you can see Yom Suf appear in the, in the text. It, at the level of intelligent thought. Now, there's other ways that we can see this appear in the wording as well, and that gets even more, even very fascinating as well. Uh, in some ways, more fascinating, and maybe in other ways, not as important. But let's talk about the stuff that's easy to see first. It talks about the lamb being slain. That is an end of life of some sort. And it says, from the creation of the world. And, of course, the beginning is an end of some sort. It's the be and, and the end is the end of another sort, okay, because the beginning and the end are two ends of some sort. So we see end here, we see end of life here, but we also know that the lamb who was slain rose to a new life. And so the reversal of that process, of course, is also a very much an important part of this verse and what it's trying to speak to us as well. But then it goes on to say, if anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword, he will be killed. So right here we see another place where it's talking about the end of life of believers. Because some people will be killed with the sword. Okay, that is their life being ended. But we also know that if a believer is killed by the beast in the future, that he's going to rise to a new life. So yes, we know that he's going to have an end of life, but we also know that it's going to be the beginning of a new life for him. Their death will be reversed. Now, there's another place where we see a play on words with Suf Chaim in here, and that's with the phrase, the book of life. 
Because the way you say book of life in Hebrew is Sefer Chayim. That's how you say book of life. And it is a wordplay on Suf Chayim. Because how do you get Sefer Chayim from Suf Chayim? You just add one letter. Not much different at all. And we understand that what the book of life symbolizes is that it represents all those whose life has ended, whose life, who will rise to a new life, rise to eternal life in the next life. And so that's very much intricately woven into the whole concept of what Yom Suf is all about, which is the reversal of the process of death. The book of life very much symbolizes Yom Suf in a very important way. So it's no surprise that we see it right here. Once again, this is getting way beyond the realm of coincidence. Every event that appears in Revelations 12 through 16 and even into 17 parallels the next encampment of the wilderness journey. Every event, just like these that we've talked about. I've talked about the, the first few here, but it, it takes a long time to explain them all. And, but I do explain them all in my book, The 42 Journey Pattern of Our Spiritual Growth and Prophecy. In my book, I do explain every event, and I show how every event in the book of Revelation, between chapters 12 and chapter 16, and even into 17, parallels the next encampment of the wilderness journey. I've explained enough that you can see that there's more going on here than just coincidence because there's too much detail matching up and lining up with the original pattern in order for this to be a mere coincidence. This had to have happened due to someone's design and due to the fact that an intelligent thought was put into making certain that these events lined up this way. The symbolism of the wilderness pattern explains for us the symbolism of the book of Revelation. One of the biggest things a lot of people stumble over is they can see that the book of Revelation has a lot of symbolism to it, but they don't really understand the keys to decoding it. However, the keys to understanding the symbolism that the book of Revelation gives is in the scriptures. It's in, part of the key is in the 42 journey pattern. Now, there are several other keys that exist to understanding all of the symbolism, but understanding the 42 stage pattern is one of the most important keys in order to understand all of the symbolism that the book of Revelation uses. And some of that symbolism has been misunderstood because we have not been using Scripture to interpret Scripture. For example, it helps us understand what the fig tree symbolizes. In fact, in my book, I go into it eight to ten pages or so of explaining what the fig tree actually symbolizes. Now, a lot of people teach that the fig tree symbolizes Israel. That's not what it represents. Now, they haven't used Scripture to interpret the fig tree. They've simply pulled that out of thin air and mention that largely because it helps a lot of date setting. I think that got started back in the 80s or 70s when people began coming up with ideals like um, trying to come up with 87 reasons why our Messiah would return in 1987 and so forth. And that kind of helped, that became a parallel that sort of helped promote that theory. Uh, but we need to stick with theories that are correct and we need to use Scripture to interpret Scripture. And when we use the 42 stage, pattern in order to understand what the fig tree is all about, then we can begin to understand what it really symbolizes and the real message that is in there for us. Now, I've given you enough examples in order to demonstrate to you that the symbolism of Revelation is very heavily based on this 42 journey pattern. Let me also show you something else. I want to show you an example of a particular stage that does a couple of different things because many of the lessons that we find in this 42 journey pattern contains very practical advice to us on how to live our life and what to do when we get into a situation of trial and testing and these messages are sometimes very practical in the advice they give us and sometimes they're very inspiring in the way they give us advice or encourage us to do what we are supposed to do and sometimes you see both of those things rolled into one. Quite often, you have to be able to get back to the original Hebrew thought in order to see the message that's there. Let me give you one very good example of that. One very good example of that is the stage called Rephidim. Now, there's a couple of different things that this could mean because Rephidim could mean spread them. That, that's one of the things that it could mean. 
it could also be a contraction of the phrase rafot yadim, which in Hebrew means weakening of the hands. Now, there actually is a very important message in this stage. Because when you look at the possible meanings it could have, well, it could be spread them, it could be weakening of the hands, what is it really trying to say to me? The answer to that is actually both, as we'll see on the next slide. This is not an either-or thing, but both wrapped into one. Because the message to the stage, Rephidim, is actually when your hands are weak, spread them. Now, you might be sitting there wondering, well, what does that mean, and how do we know that? Well, there is a way that I can show you that this is the message to this stage, even without relying on the etymology of the word and where it probably came from or might have come from or what it means or, or whatever. We can actually see that this is the message of this stage through the stories that appear in Exodus or Shemot chapter 17 and 18 when they camped at this location. There are three stories about what happened to Israel when Israel was camped at the location that was called Rephidim. And each of these three stories have something in common. Each of them involved a problem that can be described as dealing with weak hands or a weakening of the hands. And each story involved a solution that involved spreading the hands. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at the next slide. One of the three stories was the battle against the Amalekites. And in that story, Israel won the battle when Moshe, or Moses, kept his hand raised, but they started losing the battle whenever his hands were too weak to keep them up. And so that is a story that involved weak hands, and involved weak hands in a very physical sense. The solution, again, was to spread a spreading of the hands, and again, in a very physical sense, because the solution to their problem was that Aaron, or Aharon, and her helped Moshe, or Moses, spread his hands up so that they could win the war. In fact, one interesting thing about this is that when it describes the problem, it says that Moshe could not keep his hand up, that is, single hand, a hand, the hand that had the staff in it. But when Aaron and Hur rushed to his help, of course, they held up both of his hands, which kind of shows you how man sort of reacts to problems because sometimes we try to help God along with a little bit extra effort. But there are ways in which someone can be described as having weak hands or experiencing a weakening of the hands in Hebrew thought that has nothing to do with your physical hands, or, or at least not, a, not necessarily directly related to that, because the phrase weakening of the hands can be a Hebrew idiom for being afraid. Now, in English, we do have an expression that is somewhat similar to this, actually more than one expression. Sometimes we might describe someone as being weak in the knees or shaking in their boots or something along those lines. And to really understand why that's described as someone who is afraid, you've got to get a mental picture of what that's describing. It's really describing someone who's trembling all over. His hands are shaking, his arms are shaking, his knees are shaking, because he is so afraid for his life that he can barely even stand up. And if you can picture that in your mind, then you can see what the expression weak in the knees, or what the expression means in English, or what the expression weakening of the hands means to Hebrew thought. It act, it's describing the same thing. Someone who is very, very much afraid for his life. Now, when Israel journeyed to Horeb, which was part of Rephidim, um, they were afraid for their life. And their state, their mental state, can definitely be described as a weakening of the hands because they were very much afraid. It says in Exodus 17.3 that they came up to Moshe or Moses and said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt just to die, Okay. You know, I mean, their normal, their philosophy here was, you know, if we had died in Egypt, well, at least they would have had graves to put us in. You know, you brought us out here in the wilderness where we're not only going to die, but our bodies are going to be scattered and we're not even going to be treated with respect after our death like we would have if we had just stayed in Egypt. What was the solution to their problem? Well, the solution to their problem was that Moshe or Moses spread out his hands and he struck the rock. And when he did, water flowed from the rock and gave them water what they needed in order to live. So this story is yet another story in which the problem can be described as a weakening of the hands of some sort. It, here, a figurative weakening of the hands. And their solution was another spreading of the hand. In this case, a literal spreading of the hands. Okay? He spread his hands. He struck the wall. 
However, it wasn't really the spreading of the hands and striking the rock that did it. It was really the way God honored that and the way God used that as a symbol to the way he fulfilled for us what our own hands couldn't do. But again, this is another story in the encampment of Rephidim that deals with a weakening of the hands as the problem and a spreading of the hands as the solution. There is yet a third story as to what happened to Israel at this encampment that also deals with weak hands of some sort and a solution that involved a spreading of the hands in another st sort, in a figurative sense here, because he, the third story that happened um, really deals with understanding weak hands and spreading the hands in a figurative sense. The hand in Hebrew thought can be used to symbolize power, strength, or nearness. And so to, dis to talk about weak hands, we could be referring to the inability to have the power to accomplish something or to have the strength to do something. And whether you're talking about physically lifting 3,000 pounds or whether you're talking about the ability to get something done, such as build a house in a single day, okay, we might still describe both of those things as being a case of having weak hands. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you're afraid, although most frequently the reason you're afraid is because you don't have the power to stop a life-threatening situation. But what it's really referring to is the inability to get something done. Um, we see that story unfold in Exodus 18 where Moshe was unable to judge all of Israel. Not because he wasn't fair, but because there just wasn't enough time in the day to get it all done. He was one person. He was dealing with a nation of 600,000 families probably over a million and a half people, and he just simply did not have enough hours in the day for him to do it all. So somebody came to him and said, Moses, you need help. Okay, get some other people to help you, appoint them as judges, and let them come to you if they don't understand how to solve this case. But you can't do it all yourself. You need help. Okay, this is a case that can be described as Moses having weak hands because he just did not have the resources that he needed to get it all done. That is weak hands. Now, getting other people to help you judge Israel can also be described as a spreading of the hands in some sort. And it can be described as a spreading of the hands from several different viewpoints. One way in which it can be described as a spreading of the hands is this. When we talk about one person working through another in Hebrew thought, a lot of times we'll say they're working al yaday through that person. In other words, through their hands. Now, we don't really describe working through someone as as through their hands in English thought, but that is the way it's described in Hebrew thought. And if we were to say that God was working through the hands of Moses to judge Israel, we were really saying, we're recognizing the fact that it was God who was judging Israel, even though Moses was doing it. Okay? That God was working through Moses in order to judge Israel. Now, we see that when he commissioned other judges to help him, that you had Moses working through these other judges in order to judge Israel. And we know that they, Moses was working through them because he was still the chief. If they had a case that they didn't know enough to solve, they were supposed to come to Moses. So this is still Moses working through their hands. It's God working through the hands of Moses and Moses working through the hands of these judges whom he has appointed to help him out. So the way in which this is figuratively thought of as a spreading of the hands is not that easy to see in English thought, but it's very easy to see in Hebrew thought. Now, there is another way that this could be described as a spreading of the hands because I'm sure that when Moshe or Moses commissioned these judges to judge Israel, he laid hands on them, he blessed them, he commissioned them. That's referred to in Hebrew as smikah, okay, that laying on of the hands that helps appoint someone to the office they're about to undertake. And that type of laying on the hands has always been very important in Jewish thought because a rabbi cannot even be, call himself a rabbi unless he has had hands laid on him by someone who is already considered a rabbi because that type of commission is supposed to be passed down from Moshe or Moses to whoever is taking it today. And the theory is that if you didn't have hands laid on you by someone who had la hands laid on him, by someone who had hands laid on him, by someone who, somewhere down the chain, had their hands laid on by Moses, then you have not inherited that office. And of course, this is a topic that I could talk a lot more about, and it's actually a very fascinating topic to get into, but I'm going to have to abbreviate this to the narrow way in which it fits into this story, because that's something I could really speak a whole sermon on and very fascinating thing to do but I want to get back to the meaning of 
the encampments, and how this applies to our life today. Now, just in case you're sitting there wondering where Rephidim fits into the book of Revelation, I'll, I'll give you this much, because this is actually a very fascinating thing to delve into, and something I delve into in the book. Um, but we see Rephidim appear in Revelation 13, 16, and 17, where it says, He forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or his forehead, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark. Now, th you can see that not allowing someone to buy or sell, that is in in limiting them to weak hands in Hebrew thought. We can describe that as weak hands in Hebrew thought, okay, because you're not able to do something. And not being able to do something is considered having weak hands in Hebrew thought. And, of course, the solution to that is to have the mark of the beast stamped on your hand. Of course, that's not God's solution to it, but that is the solution that the beast is going to impose on mankind at some point in the future. Now, this is something I go into even more detail on in the book, but even showing you just this small slice of information, okay, is enough for you to see that this is a topic that's well worth studying and, and very fascinating, and it's a very fascinating thing, I, I feel like, that I that's actually in the book, and, and many more examples like this. Now, there is another place in which the 42 journey pattern can be seen prophetically in scriptures, and it can also be seen in the entire history of the world, from Genesis or Bereshit on into the coming of the Messiah, because the first three encampments actually spiritually speak to us about the fall of man and him leaving paradise or the Garden of Eden. The flood symbolizes and parallels the crossing of the Yom Suf, because just as Pharaoh was drowned by the sea and Israel passed through unharmed, so did God destroy the world in Noah's time, but save the righteous, Noah and his family, in that process. The Tower of Babel can be seen being fulfilled in encampments 4 through 6. The call of Abraham in encampments 7 through 10. Sodom and Gomorrah can be seen symbolized through encampments 11 through 17. The 11th encampment is one called the Graves of Lust. And it's not hard for you at all to see how that could fit in to what was going on at Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, Israel going down to Egypt, coming out, even the coming of the Messiah, him dying and rising again, can be seen in encampments 32 and 33. The fall of Israel can be seen in encampments 33 and 34. The entire history of mankind it actually can be seen unfolding in these 42 stages. Now, on this slide, I've really only talked about history and how you can see what's happened in the past reflected in the 42 stages. But what's going to happen in the future is also reflected in these, this 42-journey pattern. And it's very fascinating to really see how much information this 42-journey pattern really reveals to us about what's going to happen in the future. This is another prophetic pattern. It's a different one than what appears in Revelations 12. But, it, but it's also a prophetic pattern. It, it covers a longer time period, that is, the entire history of the world, rather than just a 42-month period. Another very fascinating place that the 42-journey pattern appears is in Psalms 22, 23, and 24. Now, this, in, in a way, it deals with prophecy, but more directly, it deals with the gospel. And this actually shows us a place where the gospel message is revealed to us through the 42 journey pattern and a way in which the life of the Messiah in, this, in the case of Psalm 22, his suffering was fulfilled in the 42 journey pattern. But all the way through Psalms 22, 23, and 24, we see successive encampments being paralleled by successive events or descriptions or, or poetry that appears in these psalms. For example, let's take a look at Psalm 22 because this is one of the more important ones and a very fascinating one. When we take a look at Psalm 22, the very first verse actually parallels leaving Ramses and going to Sukkot, which was the first journey that Israel undertook. In verses 2 and 3, we actually see being paralleled what is represented by Israel leaving Sukkot and going to Etham, which was the second encampment. Psalms 22.4 parallels the place known as pi ha -Hiroth. Now, I'm not going to go into detail on that right this minute because what I want to focus on is probably the most fascinating aspect of how Psalms 22 is actually seen in the 42 journey pattern, and, and that is in one of the verses that has been very much disputed and very controversial over the years. Psalms 22.16 is one of the more controversial verses of Scripture, 
And we really find that the 42 journey pattern helps us understand what it's actually trying to say and helps us resolve this controversy. Because Psalms 22.15 matches Hatzarot, which refers to surroundings. Psalms 22.16 corresponds to Rhythma, which means hitched or fastened or bound. Psalms 22.17 and 18 corresponds to Ramon Perez, which refers to separating uh, the pomegranates. And we actually find that this helps us understand and interpret what these verses are trying to say, because Psalms 22.16 is the one that has been in so much controversy. We see the theme of Chatzaroth appear in Psalm 22.15, because Chatzaroth means surroundings, and what we see being described in this verse is that it says, dogs have encompassed me. So it's talking about the Messiah, and it's talking about him being surrounded by something, encompassed by dogs. So the theme of Chatzaroth very definitely appears here in Psalm 22.15. Now, when we get to Psalm 22:16, we expect to see rhythma in here somewhere, just as we saw Chatzaroth in Psalm 22:15, just as we saw uh, the departure from Egypt and going to Sukkot appear in Psalm 22:1. We expect to see rhythma right here in some way. Now, this verse has always been very controversial because it's been translated differently by different groups. In most Christian translations, it says, they have pierced my hands and my feet. That's what it says in Psalms 22:16, And that fits rhythma, because rhythma means hitched or fastened or bound. And we understand that this is referring to the Messiah being fastened to the cross, having nails driven into his hands and his feet in order to bind him or fasten him to the cross. In most Orthodox Jewish translations of the scripture, what we see here is something similar to the JPS in which it says, like a lion, they are at my hands and my feet. Now, this does not fit rhythm. Now, this is the way it's usually translated and interpreted according to the Orthodox Jewish understanding of things, but this doesn't fit rhythm. And when we go on to 2217, we see Ramon Peretz there. We can, see all of, we can see the various stages going from the first verse all the way to the end. But if we interpret this as is like a lion, then it breaks the pattern. And Rithima is the only encampment that doesn't fit somewhere where we expect to see it. But if we interpret this according to they have pierced my hands and my feet, then we do see Rithima in here, and it does fit, and the pattern is kept the way we expect to see the pattern kept. Now let's talk about the reason why we have these two interpretations. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, what we see is Kof, Aleph, Resh, Vav, as it appears here in the slide, Kuru, and that basically means they have pierced. Okay? The Kaf, the first three letters, the, the three letters to the right refer to being pierced, and the Vav at the end, of course, is purely grammatical. Now, what we see in the Maseratic text is Kari, Kaf, Aleph, Resh, Yud, and you, and you can see by looking at these two writings that Vav and Yud look a lot alike. The Vav and the Yud are the leftmost letters in these two variant versions. And you can see that if you make a, a, that bottom letter just a little bit longer, the top letter just a little bit too short, then a little bit of ban, bad handwriting can cause you to confuse one for the other. And that's exactly why some manuscripts have one, some manuscripts have the other. Um, but even if we throw out the whole Dead Sea Scrolls interpretation here, uh, the issue isn't whether the Dead Sea Scrolls are right or whether Maseratic text is correct, because it still boils down to the interpretation of what's in the Maseratic text um, and, and what letters are really part of the root word and what letters are there for purely grammatical reasons. In the JPS and many other Orthodox Jewish it, translations of the Scripture, the way this is being interpreted is that that first letter, Kof, the rightmost letter, Kof, is interpreted grammatically to refer to like or similarity, and the last three letters, Ari, Aleph, Resh, Yud, are interpreted to mean lion, which, of course, is what it does mean. So in the JPS interpretation, what we have is Kaf being added to Ari in order to in bring us a word that means like a lion. Now, that's not the only way to look at this, because if you look at the last letter, Yud as being grammatical, and the first three as being the root word, then you take the word for pierce, Kaf, Aleph, Resh, and you add to it a yud at the end, and what you have is a word that means piercers of. So you can either translate this like a lion or piercers of my hands and my feet. 
Now to refer to the dogs that have surrounded you as piercers of my hands and my feet makes sense. And what we've got is a reasonable logical flow in the wording of scriptures if we interpret it the way we see that way, the, the, the second way, the piercers of. If we interpret this as like a lion, then what we have is a sentence that says, like a lion are my hands and my feet, which doesn't make any sense at all. And that's why in the JPS and many other Orthodox Jewish translations, they've had to alter the wording and actually insert some of their own wording into it in order to make some sense out of it, because what it says in the JPS is like a lion, they are at my hands and my feet. They've actually added the words they are at to the sentence, even though it's not there in the original text. But they realize that if they don't add it, then they can't make any sense out of the sentence whatsoever. Of course, there's actually nothing wrong with the text. It has all the words that it needs in order to give us the correct understanding of what it's saying. It's just that in order to interpret it the way that it makes grammatical sense, then you interpret it in a way that fits the gospel. The gospel message also appears several places in this 42 journey pattern. One of the things that our Savior said to his disciples what is recorded in Luke 24, 44 through 47. And this has kind of boggled some people's minds. But he said, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moshe or Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. And he told them, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached. Now, a number of people can turn to places in the prophets or the Psalms and point out where it predicts his death. But where do you see it predicting his death lasting for exactly three days and then rising again after three days? Most people would have a lot of trouble pointing to a scripture where it actually says that. However, in the 42 journey pattern, I show you exactly where that appears in Scripture. Because it is in there. It does predict that his death would happen for exactly three days. It actually predicts that in more than one place. And in my book, where I unravel the 42 journey pattern, I show you exactly where the prediction of his death lasting three days happens in Scripture. His whole life fulfilled this 42 journey pattern. In fact, we could see the beginning of that in the Gospel of Yohanan, or John, where it says the Word became flesh and did tabernacle among us. Tabernacle, of course, there's Sukkot. That's what that word means. And tabernacling among us, Etham, that was the next place they went to after Sukkot. So we can actually see his life paralleling the 42 journey pattern right there at the opening of that Gospel. There are other mysteries that are revealed in my book, The 42 Journey Pattern of Our Spiritual Growth in Prophecy. It reveals a lot of mysteries that are hidden beneath the symbolism of scriptures, like the ones that I have cited for you so far. It reveals many more. In fact, you'll find that this is a fascinating book where page after page after page contains new information that you may have never thought of or maybe you had thought of and you've always wanted to know the answer and suddenly it's there. Such as what was the reason for that bronze snake or many other, or, or why the raising of the hands, which I did explain earlier, in order to defeat an army. And, and many other things that maybe you wondered about and always wanted to know the answer but never knew it. Well, many of the symbolic aspects to the wilderness journey are explained in this book in a very fascinating way. But it also can be described as somewhat of a spiritual self-help book because it also, in the process of doing that, provides you with a ton of practical advice on how to live your life in order to live a better life, in order to live a victorious life, and in order to overcome the spiritual journeys and obstacles that you face in this life in order to get to where you are supposed to be. It not only contains a ton of practical advice, but it does it in a way that is very fascinating to study and in a way that you're probably not used to hearing that type of advice being delivered. If you're interested in either ordering a book or contacting me about coming to speak at your congregation, you can get in touch with me with the contact information that is here on the slide that you're looking at at this present time. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation, and if you have, I'm sure that you're going to enjoy my book, The 42 Journey Pattern, uh, tremendously. Click below to subscribe to my channel, and don't forget to visit my website at www.messiahalive.net That's www.
www.messiahalive.net.